Have you ever looked at the speedometer on your car and you thought, I wonder what my car can really do? You know how it kind of goes up sometimes like to 140 miles an hour, 160 miles an hour? Now, I'm not recommending you do that. But have you ever just sort of wondered, what if? You ever do? Yeah, okay. All the guys put up their hands. All the women are like, no, 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 no. Or, or, or who, who here likes flying? Actually enjoys being in an airplane? Oh, there's more than... Oh, oh, some of you, okay, good, good. I like that. Have, have you ever wondered, you know, that we, we, they fly those Q400s into Pangborn? And you've you flown out of Wenatchee? Ever flown out of Wenatchee? One of those, yeah, the, the Q400s? Have you ever wondered, could one of those things do a barrel roll? The answer is yes. Not that I know, um, but I, I don't know if you remember the story from, uh, it was uh, August 10th of uh, 2018, and Richard Russell actually commandeered a Q400 from, uh, from, from SeaTac, and before he crash landed, um, su successfully did a number of barrel rolls in the same plane that you have flown in. Isn't that just cool to think about? Now, some of you are maybe joining me on the podcast while you're on an airplane right now, and now it's no longer cool to think about. But when we're on the ground and we're feeling secure, it's like, it's like what if they could do that? Or, you know, or, um, those 737s, you know, like if you've ever flown out of like a real airport, you know, you've probably flown in a 737, one of those things. So apparently, this, this is really fun. Okay, so it was during the prototyping of the 737, a pilot named Tex Johnson, isn't that just the best name for like a test pilot? So he was, he was demoing, some of you know this, who heard, yeah, yeah, Bonnie worked at Boeing, who else has worked at Boeing? Yeah, so you know about this. Okay, so he was demoing the 707 above Lake Washington and he thought, I should just do a barrel roll because it can. And he did. Um, of course, he got called into you know, uh, you know, the headquarters a few days later to say, just because it can doesn't mean you should because we actually want people to fly on this thing. But when you get into one of those airplanes, you know, at like, you know, at SeaTac or, 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 or Spokane or something, just think about that. That plane, it could do it. It probably won't, <laughs> but it could. And wouldn't that, wouldn't that be the coolest thing ever? And everybody's like, no, that would not be cool at all. But, but it's fun to think about the potential and take a look at the potential, like the full potential of your car, of your airplane, or in the passage we're going to be looking at today in Acts chapter 2. This is a snapshot of the potential of the local church. Now, where we're going to be picking up the story is Acts chapter 2. Verse, we're just going to look at verses 42 through 47. Kind of do a deep dive there. So if you've got your Bibles, open them up. You've got your version Bibles, open it up. Um, because this gives us a snapshot into what can happen when the Holy Spirit fully kind of takes control of a local church. This local group of believers. And maybe even it'll help us to rethink when we pray for things like revival. Lord, bring revival here. Lord, bring revival in our land. Gives us a snapshot to better understand what that looks like. Because at least for me, when I was, you know, in, in the church environments that I was raised in, when I think of things like revival, I think of, of Christians getting really, really excited or loud music or, you know, in, in some cases, who here has some Pentecostal background? Put your hands up because you can. All right, that's what we do. I have, I've had some wonderful um, experiences with the Pentecostal church because I met a really wonderful girl in the Pentecostal church. But where, where revival is basically about like, like kind of maybe some, some more outrageous stuff happening or some things that are just seem, seem a little more emotional happening. Um, and, and those things are true. Those things are true. I think that God works in that is true revival, but it's not the fullest picture of revival. 
Here in Acts chapter 2, where the, where the Holy Spirit catches hold of an entire group of people. And, and for a brief time, you know, before any persecution, before all the, all the heresies, before all of the power struggles and conflicts, for a brief time, everything just worked. It just, it just worked. And so it's beautiful to take a look at that and go, so that's what could happen. That's what could happen if the Holy Spirit, without any hindrance, just empowered a group of people. So let's dive in together. Right, so let's just read the whole passage, and then I want to kind of deep dive through some, some things there because there are some, there are some characteristics of a spirit-empowered church that are helpful for us to know. Um, throughout the month of June, we're going to be looking at uh, taking a closer look at this theme of service, like how the church is called to serve. But even as we do, uh, we, and as we as we look at that, you know, that call to service, we're also going to be looking at how the Holy Spirit empowers us to serve. Because the church is so much more than a service club. The, ser- the church is more than just a bunch of do-gooders coming together to try to do good things, though it should be at least that. It is, it is the Holy Spirit um, filling a group of people, and one of the fruits of that infilling is, is that people are, are empowered for service. Okay, so let's take a look. Acts chapter 2. So they, the believers, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many signs and wonders performed by the apostles. All the believers were together, and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Can you see it in your mind's eye? That'd be cool, wouldn't it? Let's take a closer look. Starting things off, verse 42. They devoted themselves. Say with me, devoted. Devoted. All right, we're in this together. We can do this. I, I'm going to say some stuff. You say some stuff. We'll all work it out. Okay. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. The, the, a spirit empowered church starts with a life of devotion. It starts with worship, that we want to hear the words of Jesus. We want to talk to Jesus in prayer individually and corporately. And it's in, it's, at least I think it's important for us to notice that the very heart, the very heart of that spirit-empowered church was that life of devotion. The connecting with Christ individually, corporately, like that life of worship, that was enough. That was, the, that was the, the, the spark plug in the engine, if you will. Notice that it wasn't, it wasn't getting excited about some other thing. Like, like you know, uh, we, one could imagine, like, here all this, this cool stuff is starting to happen, and some miracles are starting to happen, and, and people are getting really moved. And so you think, all right, now it's time. Now we can finally rally people to get rid of them Romans. And we can start turning a worship gathering into a political rally. Or, you know, or maybe, maybe you're not going to pick on the Romans, though. The Romans, no, there's no one in the, in, in the early church that, would, that liked the Roman occupation. Not a single one. Or maybe it would, this would be a moment to get back at the Sadducees. Because there was a religious sect that didn't believe in the resurrection, like, you know, back in Jesus' time. And this would be a fantastic moment to kind of go all neener, neener, neener on them. You know, like, hey, look at this. We got this figured out. And y'all over there, look at you. Look how wrong you are. I'm going to post a meme about you. I got some tweets to talk about it because Jesus is alive and he's resurrected. And you're wrong, baby. I mean, you could, you could get excited about that. 
And in fact, we see groups getting excited about that in our land as well. But a spirit-empowered church starts with a life of devotion. The one we get excited about is Jesus. What we long for is connection to Jesus. The words we want to hear are the words of Jesus. It starts with a life of devotion. Do you have a life of devotion? Are you longing to connect with Jesus? And then we move on to the next line. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. So out of this life of devotion, some pretty cool spirit stuff started to happen. Like miracles started to happen. You ever seen a miracle? Or maybe more importantly, do you expect miracles in your life? Now, it's important to remember when we see miracles and, and even these, like some of the gifts of healing that we're going to be taking a closer look at um, actually next week. But, um, you know, the, these stories of healing, um, God uses people to do that. He used the apostles to do that. But it wasn't the apostles' power that, that was healing people. It was, it was the power of the Holy Spirit working through the apostles, that's why when we pray for people, we can pray boldly because, it's, because uh, God's ability to heal somebody, for example, isn't dependent on how wonderful your life is. It's not about how much you've got your stuff together or how holy you are or how talented you are or how good you feel about yourself. It is all about the power of God. So we can pray boldly asking God to intervene in the lives of the people we care about. Intervene in situations where we know that people are suffering. God, would you do a miracle here? And while it's true that God doesn't always answer those prayers in the ways that we expect, sometimes he still really answers. I've seen miracles of healing in my life. Certainly can't control it. Can't always predict what's going to happen. But I've seen God take impossible situations and turn them around. Have you? Have you? Oh, like three of you? The God of the Bible, the God, the Holy Spirit that is present in the church now, that lives in your heart if you are a follower of Jesus. That's a God that, that can and does work miracles. Expect it. Ask for it. Now, that God is not a vending machine. It's not if you, you know, put the quarters in in the right order and then push the button that, that you know, the candy's going to drop. But, that, that, but the God that we serve is like a good father who knows the needs of his kids and wants to hear what you, what I, what we have to say. So talk to him and expect miracles. And so out of this life of devotion and these like kind of sprinklings of miracles that are happening in the early church as, as, as the apostles and, and, and other church leaders that God is doing, doing incredible things through them in terms of like supernatural stuff. Something started to happen in the life of the believers and that's the next part I want to look at. So all the believers, they were together. And they had everything in common. And so they sold property and possessions. In other words, they had a lot of yard sales. Right? What, what else, how else do you apply this stuff? They did yard sales. They got on Facebook Marketplace every now and again. You know, Jerusalem Marketplace. Craigslist. Or, you know, Craig Scroll. I don't know what that is. But, you know. but they did stuff. They sold stuff to give to anyone who had need. 
So one of the signs of a spirit-empowered church is this unforced generosity of people that actually feel so filled up by the goodness of God that know that God loves them, that know that God is providing for them, are probably experiencing that not only in spiritual ways, but material ways. And so just like a cup that's had, you know, that's, that had, had a whole lot of water poured into it and it starts to overflow, it's kind of like that. This unforced generosity. I have enough. In Jesus, I have enough. He's provided for me. I have enough. It means I have enough to give something away to those who may not have enough. Some of the most generous people I've ever met, uh, just, uh, well, they're, well, one, they're, they're I, that's one of the ways they express their faith. This unforced generosity. People care about one another so much that they just give. Now, there, there have been times in church history that uh, people have said, well, see, that is like, see, the early church, it was, com- it was like communism or it was like socialism. And to a certain degree, that's true, actually. Because they, they worked together. Everybody shared. Except for here's the part that make it not like communism or socialism. It was unforced. It just happened. It didn't happen because of a set of rules. It didn't happen because of a government. It didn't happen or you're going to go to the gulag. It, didn't, it, just, it just happened. It happened because the love of Jesus just overflowed out of a group of people. So they started to share because they honestly cared about one another. And they knew that in Christ, they'd been given more than enough. You ever seen that happen? That kind of generosity? You know one of the best parts about working in a church like Columbia Grove? I get to see that all the time. You guys just rock at this. This is a crazy, generous church. Who here was, was like here yesterday? Yeah. And now some of you can barely raise your arms because you were here for like 12 hours yesterday. There were people here at like 5.30 in the morning just to get ready for this yard sale. Unbelievable amounts of stuff. You guys did just knocked it out of the park. But, but this is even that spirit of generosity. I'm going to give of my stuff so that people that don't have enough can start to have enough. And so even the, you know, got to hear, the, I'll let Paul announce the numbers a little bit later. I'm not going to steal your thunder, buddy. Not at all. But they did, they, they did a lot of stuff. And it's going to go towards some really, really great things. So you want, yeah, and, and Morgan says it was a lot of fun too. But that's one of the marks. That's one of the marks of a spirit-empowered church. Unforced generosity. Some of y'all emptied out your garages with unforced generosity. And yes, maybe you benefited from decluttering. That is good. Mary Kondo would be proud of you. But, but, you, but, you, but you gave. You gave. You gave. There's no such thing as a stingy, mature Christian. One of the marks of the Spirit's work in your life, in my life, and in our life together is that we grow in unforced generosity. Lord, thank you for giving me enough. It is such a joy to give some of what you have given me to somebody else so it can benefit others. So let's move on. Let's move on. So that's one of the marks. Unforced generosity. Service. Okay? Then every day, every day, they continue to meet together in the temple courts. So in large spots, large spaces. They broke together, bred together in their homes. They had small group meetings as well. And they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. It's one of the other marks of 
of a spirit-empowered church, of people who actually love Jesus so much that they start to love one another, who enjoy time together with Jesus so much that they start to enjoy time together with one another as well. And it happens in a wide variety of ways, sometimes in larger gatherings like, like a church service, but also small gatherings in homes, in coffee shops, in backyards. People connect. They connect with other Christians. Have you been connecting with other Christians? Is that an area in your life that God has been developing? For some of you, that's like the very core of your faith. It's something that comes easily. That's beautiful. That's wonderful. For others, it's a little harder. But as we grow in our faith, as the Spirit takes hold of our lives, my life, your life, we connect with other believers. We start to share experiences. We share each other's joys. We share each other's sorrows. We share each other's stories. We become safe places where we can have real conversations. We become safe places where we can give feedback to one another. Hey, are you aware about that thing? And no, I, I wasn't. And whatever it is. Because you know, none of us see ourselves clearly in the mirror. We, we, need other, we need other perspectives. We need other eyes. So there's this connection, a life of worship and devotion. And people experienced miracles together. And there was this outpouring of unforced generosity. And people started to share life together. And they were praising God. And then as it continues, it says, and they were enjoying the favor of all the people. See, this is one of the reasons why, you know, like if you've probably noticed that, that the culture around us is changing. It's changing rapidly, in fact. And in Christianity and Christian values and ethics, while they used to feel like they were kind of at the center of, of our life together, even as a nation, now, in many cases, some of those values are looking more and more out of place. Out of sorts. It's, we have less cultural favor than we used to have. Would you agree with me? This passage also shows us one of the key ways to get that back. And that's just do it. Be known for our devotion to Christ, for our unforced generosity to the world around us, and for our honest care for one another. That we serve. That we connect. I believe that in, in, the, gen, in, the, in the, the years to come, that yeah, as somebody is exploring faith, they're starting to, you know, the Holy Spirit's starting to move in their life, and they're starting to wonder, is God real? And, and um, you know, like, should I, should I make anything of this? The thing that they're going to be looking for more than anything else in terms of evidence of that isn't so much a YouTube video or, a, or even a great apologetics book, though I hope those things are all around, you know, continue to be around, people who can explain the faith well. I think most of the time, most of the time, as their loved ones come to Christ, what they're going to need is they just need to see it. They need to see a group of people actually living it out. Like, so all that stuff, does it actually work? Like, are there Christians who will actually just, like, care for one another? Who care for the needs of the society around them? Who are known for their unforced generosity of, of goods, but also an unforced generosity of spirit? What are they for? Does it, is it real? It's one of the reasons I believe that the local church continues to be God's plan A for impacting the world. 
Like having a really vibrant, thriving local church, whatever the form that local church takes, whether it's large, whether it's small, whether it's a house church, whatever it happens to be, but a vibrant local church, a vibrant local expression of faith is and will continue to be all the more the, you know, the, the evangelistic edge of, our, of, our, of the church as a whole. It's how people will come to Christ. They will see it. They will see it lived out in the lives of some group of believers, and they'll say, I want that. I want that. And I don't have the passage for this. I was reading this morning, and you know, just in Acts chapter 1, as Peter was finishing off his, his first big sermon, and, uh, and thousands of people... Um, came to Christ on that day of Pentecost. And Peter's message at the end of it, it said, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Now, I don't know if I'd express it exactly the same way, but, but what I do think will happen in the years to come, and why I'm so hopeful about the local church is that the loved ones around us will look at the, the, you know, the, the culture and where things are going and the, the timbre and the tone, whether it's of the political life or, the, or social life of, a, of, of culture as a whole, and they'll say, I don't like where this is going. I, this doesn't feel right. This isn't thriving. And then they see this one group of, of Christians somewhere who are living in a different way who live with that unforced generosity, who live with real relationships. And they'll go, I don't want that. I think I want this. Save yourself from this corrupt generation as our culture maybe goes, well, I, I think it's going downhill. Things are getting meaner. The world is starting to look darker. But it doesn't have to look that way here. Let your light shine. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The watching world started watching and they saw something that was different. They saw an unforced generosity. They saw real community. They saw people actually caring about one another for real and went, I think I want what they have. And they got close enough that they could hear the message of Jesus and, his, and, and how his death on the cross saved them from their sins. And how his resurrection from the dead offers them new life, not only in this life, but for all eternity. And they said, I want that. Are you praying for your loved ones? I hope you are. Are you? Are there people that you are asking, God, would you intervene in their life? I know you are. And you pray for your kids. You pray for your grandkids. You pray for your friends. You pray for your coworkers. Lord, let them see something in me. Lord, let them see something in us that causes them to see things differently. To realize this is not the only way that they can live. That there is hope. That Jesus is real. Do you believe that? That he really changes people's lives. That he, he, he was and is and continues to be the hope of the world. I want my loved ones to know that. I want grandkids that don't even exist yet. I want them to know that. So I want to be a part of building something like that. Lord, that Acts stuff, that Holy Spirit stuff, all that, that spirit empowered, that unforced generosity, that, that life of love and care and concern, Lord, do that in me. Do that in me. Do that in me. Start with me right now. Start with me. So I want to ask you, you know, of those marks, you know, the, that life of devotion, that life of connecting with other Christians, 
That life of unforced generosity, or I could think of it as service. That, Lord, do that in me. What, there's probably some areas of, 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 those, of those attributes of the church that come easily to you. Um, I know a lot of generous people here. This is a very generous church. That unforced generosity, you're doing pretty good. Um, what's the area that's maybe harder? Maybe it is that life of devotion. Getting in the word on a regular basis. Or if you're like me, where, where it's it taken me a long time to find a, a really workable rhythm of daily prayer. Just got to be honest. It's one of the reasons I get really excited about giving out prayer journals, because like that helped me. That life of devotion. Or, or maybe even that life of connection, of being intentional about building friendships. In some ways, it's harder than ever. You know, where we've got more technology to connect to one another, but we know each other less than we ever did. It seems sometimes. Maybe you felt that way. Maybe, or maybe, maybe that one. Then maybe that one comes so easily for you that you're just scoring high in the areas of connection, and there's something else that's a little harder. But when all of those pieces come together, and we lean together on the Spirit's power and presence in our life. Incredible things can happen in the local church. Would you dream with me about the local church? I want to be a part of that. I want to invest my life and my time in that. So that this one pocket of humanity we can experience that kind of unforced generosity, that life of Devotion together, those places of honest, real connection, Lord. Let it happen in us. Lord, do that in us. And this is the part where I need to remind us, because I need to remind myself this that you know, that life of worship and connection and service. It is not about me trying to get my stuff together. It's not about me pulling myself up by my bootstraps. All of it is about a life in the Holy Spirit together. Holy Spirit, deepen my life of devotion. Do in me what I cannot do in myself. Holy Spirit, teach me how to connect with other people believers well. Give me the strength to take that one step to meet that one new person this morning. Holy Spirit, show me where I'm supposed to invest myself in service and in generosity. I can't do it all, but you can. And together we can do what none of us can do alone. Show me my one little part. Show me how to give. And Lord, in those places where it's hard to give, give me the strength. Our life in the Spirit isn't about us finding more habits, finding more disciplines, getting tougher and tougher, and man, you suck at that. You should be better at that. Our life in the Spirit, our life in the Spirit is a life of dependency on the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, do that in me. So what are you asking the Holy Spirit to do in you? How do you want to grow in your faith? How do you want to grow in your devotion to Jesus, your connection to Jesus? How do you want to grow in your connection to other Christians? How do you want to grow in your life of service, your life of generosity? How do you want to grow? Let's take some time together and, and ask God, Ask the Holy Spirit who is right here, who can do miracles in our midst. Let's ask him to do that and just see what happens. Lord, do that. Do that together in us. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you that you have big and beautiful plans for local churches. 
Lord, thank you that when the Spirit gets a hold of us together corporately, you can do incredible things. Lord, we look at this passage in the book of Acts. We look at the early church and we know, God, the same Holy Spirit that filled those apostles, that filled those 120 believers in a room and, and thousands and thousands came to Christ and over time, billions would come to Christ. Lord, do that again in us. Lord, do that again in me. I want my life to be yielded to you. I just invite you, friend, just, uh, just under your breath, just talk to God about what you're asking him to do in your life. Ask him for what you're at, what you're, Lord, do this in my life of devotion, my life of worship. Just talk to him about it. Take a moment. You know, take a moment to talk to God about the, the friendships in your life, the connections in your life. Is it difficult? Are there hurts? Are there things you need to heal from? Talk to him about it. Are there opportunities you need to see? Talk to him about it. In that life of service, of that unforced generosity, what are you asking him to do in your life? Ask him. We serve a God who works miracles. For the people in your life that you're longing to see come to Christ, you long for them to know the hope that you've experienced. Talk to them about it. If you could, even name them before him. Just lift up names to him in your mind. He hears every thought. Lord, reach our loved ones. Thank you, God, that you have something to say. And for anyone who may be here and, and just this morning just feels distant from God, know that he, he is closer to you than, than you could ever imagine. Lord Jesus, come into my life, come into my heart. Fill me, use me. Just give yourself to him. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that your Holy Spirit is right here. Lord, may we, Lord, may I be available to you, be empowered by you. Use me, I pray. Use me, God. Just whisper down into your breath. God, use me. Use me. Use me. Use me. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.